Uh, I, I want to share with you the concept. I know our uh, series, I was reminded this morning, Miss Dorothy, who is very astute, uh, pointed out the fact that our uh, uh, title says uh, seven declarations for a godly life, and this morning we'll make eight. And uh, that's just because I'm a generous guy. And uh, seven, biblically, is the number of completion, but eight is the number of new beginnings. And so I wanted to add a bonus uh, point this morning or declaration, and I think as we go through this, you'll see how it all fits together, that we have used Psalm 27 and then broken it down into sections, and from those, we make faith declarations for our life. And if you have your note page there, you can take those out. And if you haven't been able to be here for the series, you can access that online, uh, the former messages with the note pages as well. Uh, but to kind of uh, abbreviate that for you rather than to preach uh, the first uh, seven installments of this series again, uh, suffice it to say that we have uh, taken those verses or sometimes one, sometimes two or three verses in sections from Psalm 27 and turned them into faith declarations for our life. And a faith declaration is simply that. It's not a, a, a wishful thinking statement. It's something that God has already spoken in his word, but we're declaring over our life. And what we say and declare over our own life with conviction is a powerful thing. Proverbs says that the power of life and death is in the tongue or comes through our speech that the words we speak, not only to one another, but especially over our own life, can bring life to us or bring death to us. Uh, if you get up in the morning and you say, uh, I can't do this, you're right. If you get up in the morning and say, I'm too tired to face this day, you're right. If you face a difficult situation and say, I can't go on like this, you're right. And so what do you do? It's what you say and what you believe in your heart that determines does it mean that it's going to take all the pain away, all, everything's going to become easy, that, man, it's just going to be fantastic? No. What it means is that you're going to have strength in God, and as we sang this morning, strength will rise when you wait upon the Lord. And when you bring that before the Lord and to say, Lord, I'm just presenting my day to you, I don't feel like I have enough strength, but I'm declaring, according to Psalm 27, 1 through 3, that I will live life strong. And Father, your word says that when I am weak, then you are strong. That when I am uh, uh, take, get rid of myself, put myself to the side, that I begin to receive your grace and strength in unprecedented portions. That Father, you give strength to the weary. That you, those that wait upon the Lord, will renew their strength. And God, I need to mount up with wings like an eagle this morning because I need your perspective on these situations in my life. Lord, I'm running errands or I'm running here and there. I feel like I'm running around in circles. Whatever it is, the Lord says, if you wait upon him, you can run and not get weary. Sometimes a trip to Walmart's all you can take. Amen. All right. But God says, look, I'll give you strength because purpose is in the midst of that. And I've got, as we're walking in God's purpose and he orders our steps, Sometimes the things that would greatly frustrate you that uh, are interruptions or distractions or whatever, God will use as intersections of his divine purpose in your life. That he'll connect you with somebody and slow you down enough, give you enough strength to where you're not just trying to hang in there and barely make it to survive, but God will say, here's a person who needs what you have to give them. And because you waited on me and because you have strength from me, you can walk and not faint. You can run and not be weary. And so it's a word of encouragement. It's a smile instead of a sigh. It's a, a, a genuinely stopping to greet somebody. Notice who they are. Notice what they're going through. Or if not, just the sense that you're available to God. That he may want to use you to pray for someone who cut you off in traffic. He may want to use you to bless someone uh, in, in a line at the grocery store or uh, as you're there, just being sensitive to what God's doing. And at the same time that that ministers to us, it's, it honors us to such a degree that God would say, you know, I really can use you in every situation in life. And if you'll give me all the minutes of your day, I'll fill them. 
And not just with more stuff for you to do, but I'll fill them with meaning, I'll fill them with purpose, I'll fill them with life, I'll fill them with joy. How many of you know when God fills your day, it's full and it's good? It, it, it's stuff that you need on the agenda, amen? And so the first uh, seven declarations are there uh, in your note page, and then this morning we're going to add uh, number eight to that, and it's the number of new beginnings, and uh, the eighth faith declaration that we're going to make out of Psalm 27 is from the very last verse uh, in Psalm 27, and it says this, wait on the Lord. Notice it doesn't say wait for the Lord. It says wait on the Lord. And it says, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. And then he repeats it. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, it wasn't the fact that David was a little ADD, and when he was writing it, he just wrote it down twice because he forgot he wrote it the first time. Just like when God repeats something to us uh, or speaks something to us, it's not because he didn't remember saying it the first time. He repeats it for emphasis. Here, David is writing a song, and so it's a poetic expression. But again, when it is emphasized, he goes a little bit deeper. The word wait in the Hebrew here is the word kava, and it's actually a verb. It comes from the noun tikba in the Hebrew, which means hope. So in other words, wait is the action word, the verb for hope. Here's another way to put it. Waiting is putting hope into action. Waiting is putting hope into action, but it's deeper than that. It, it, it also has this uh, connotation or meaning to gather things together. Uh, I mentioned uh, Psalm 5, uh, 3 at the, in our worship time, where David says, I, I take the pieces of my life, I take my requests, I, I gather my stuff up, and I lay them out before you. It, it's an organized gathering, bringing together. But beyond that, there's another meaning that fits right in with this, and it literally means to, to bind together by twisting. In other words, if you take uh, a, a, a cord and you, you take another cord and you begin to bind them together, now you don't just have two cords, you have a rope. And Ecclesiastes said a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And so the, the sense here is that when we actively participate, not just passively waiting, waiting for the time to pass, waiting for the minute, waiting for the answer, waiting for the, the, the st something to happen, waiting until, waiting until I get old enough, waiting until God loves me enough, waiting until uh, I'm holy enough, waiting, that's waiting for something. And so many times when we're simply focused on an answer that we think we need. We see our situation from a limited perspective and we get so disappointed, sometimes with ourselves, but mostly with God. Because the enemy is right there accusing us that we're not worth receiving the answer anyway. Who are we to pray to a holy God to think that he would hear us, to, to, to think that we deserved anything from him? And then guilt and condemnation starts working in our life. And then now we're getting anxious of, uh-oh, I mean, it's been 20 minutes since I prayed and, and God hasn't given me a miracle or given me this or given me that. And sometimes it's a deadline. Somebody, sometimes it's other things that people impose. God, I, I, I need a financial miracle and I need it by nine o'clock this morning. And somehow, if it comes at noon, it's not God, and, and, and we begin to miss it from those very simple things. Here, David reminds us that what we're to wait on is not an answer. What we're to wait on is not a moment or an event. What we're to wait on is not something. What we're to wait on is someone. Wait on the Lord. 
And then he says that it takes courage to do that. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Why does it take courage to wait? If I said it takes patience to wait, there would be a, a holy groan in the audience. Uh, I prayed for patience one time, and I stopped that because God just put me in a situation where I had to wait. I just had to learn patience. What did you ask for? See, but so many times we see it from our perspective, and, and waiting on God becomes this deal, or checking your phone, or, or looking, expecting somebody else. God, even if you want to use somebody else to meet this need, that's fine. And so we're, we're, we're looking for something rather than waiting on someone who is the Lord. And here, when we're actively uh, engaging hope, when we're not just praying, but expecting God to answer, anticipating, not becoming anxious in the negative sense of that word, but, but there's that sense, like Christmas for children. The anxiousness isn't the anxiety of whether or not I'll get something. It, it's when is it going to come? Is it, is it Christmas today? You know, when they're little, how many more sleeps? How many more sleeps till Christmas? And, and we, can we open just one present? And, and if we had the heart of a child and really understood that every good and perfect gift comes from our Father of lights who's in heaven and, and that he really does want to open not just to spoil his kids, but God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And if we would use that scripture as a foundation for our faith, as a substructure upon which we build our life, rather than a cry of desperation when we need 20 bucks at the end of the month. God, you promised to supply all my needs. Now I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. It's not that God has hours. He doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber. Heaven's open 24 hours a day. And God sits on a throne of grace and he says, when you have a need, come. Come and sit at my feet and wait. Now, that's not in a pompous kind of way that, that you're lower than me, so you sit at my feet. It, it's that posture of receiving. It's the posture of humility. But it's also the fact that Jesus is at God's right hand, the place of power and authority, the place of delegation as the Father delegates to him. But he's not just sitting there. Scripture tells us he's standing there. And he's standing at the right hand of the Father, and he's interceding for us. He's the go-between. He's praying for us, and he's speaking to the Father on our behalf. And he's telling him of the redemption that we've received, that he's made available. And that there's nothing in our life with that record that is covered by the blood that is ever exposed. And Jesus just reminds him, Father, that's covered by my blood. Their life is covered by my blood. Father, that sin is covered by my blood. Their shame was taken away. I took that on the cross. Father, put that on my account. And he brings us back to that remembrance so grace and mercy can flow. And if we'll open our hearts to that level of understanding, it'll bring us into a whole new dynamic. Instead of waiting on these answers that, that it's, it's the only way out, it's the only thing I can see. But if we'll ask God, help me see what you see. Father, I don't, I don't see it. When I watch the news, I see a different world than what I grew up in. I don't say that because I'm old. I say that because I'm wise. Scripture says, gray hair is a crown of splendor. It's attained by a righteous life. That's what it says. Now, I don't claim all that, but it also says that, that, that those with gray hair uh, are walking a level of wisdom. So it's a crown of wisdom. So that, that's what I'm claiming. And, and, and some of y'all could claim that, but you die yours. So now you're stuck either way. So, amen. What I'm saying is, as life progresses, that, that we see that there are things that could cause trouble, things that could cause anxiety. Uh, it, it, it bothers me that we uh, have a government sometimes that, that, uh, acts like um, the the bully on the playground or or some smart aleck, and they make fun of a terrorist group and say, "Well, they're they're just junior high. They they, they don't even matter." Well, it mattered when they 
beheaded a journalist and they're getting ready to behead another one. And it's kind of this in your face thing where the scripture says in the last days, evil will increase, but knowledge will also increase. And that the, those who are righteous will turn to the Lord. And it's that time of waiting on God of like, okay, we can get a little bit anxious here when we look at the economy and we look at world events and we look at terrorism, we look at the rise of evil and we look at some of the dynamics going on even in our own country. We look at the, 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 the racial tension in uh, Ferguson, Missouri and we think, Lord, have we not moved past this? No. And it's what we need to do in moving people's hearts into a place where we understand that, that when we come together in church and we come together truly as family that God designed us to be, that he is the father of us all. And so that it's not about the color of our skin, it's about the content of our heart and character. And if God lives in us, our, all our old stuff has passed away and everything has become new. And the only way that we can see past race is through God's grace. And if we don't, then, then we're just fooling ourselves. It just becomes a matter of rhetoric. And I believe that, that God's grace will strengthen and empower us enough to where we can walk in those levels of understanding. So, so what does that mean? That, that it doesn't necessarily lessen our anxiety when we're waiting on God if we're not really sure of what that means. How, how do we wait on the Lord? I got three simple things there in your notes this morning and then I'll illustrate that for you. Let me give them to you. The first thing David says uh, in waiting upon the Lord, the very meaning of the word means to wait patiently. Wait patiently. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. With eager expectation. Okay, let me remind you again. Wait in the Hebrew is not a noun, it's a verb. It's not a passive thing, it's an active thing. Not that you take matters into your own hands and do something about it. Um, we see many of those who walk with God, even Abraham, the father of faith, the one who believed God and was credited as righteousness, was waiting upon God, but then he took matters into his own hands. If Abraham really would have waited on God to fulfill his promise and walked out the trust that he put in him, we wouldn't be dealing with Ishmael and terrorism and, and many of the, the dynamics that came out of that because Abraham tried to establish covenant in his own strength. That doesn't happen. But if you just put Genesis 15 in your notes there and then go back and read the account, if you're not familiar with it, where as God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, then there's years that go by. And in Genesis 15, God speaks to him again and he says, I'm your shield, your very great reward. Walk before me. And, and Abraham comes into this place with God and God is drawing him to a place where he wants to establish covenant with him. And Abram doesn't know that. He's just walking, uh, trying to believe this promise. And so God again speaks the promise to him. Everybody say promise. And he says, here's what's gonna happen. Through your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Through your seed, not a seed. Not, not an heir that you produce, that one coming from your own body. He didn't get all that. And, and so he's like, Lord, how can this be? Uh, I'm childless. Uh, Eleazar, uh, one of my uh, servants, sons, uh, and the, the dynamic here is the only one I could even hope to, to have my inheritance. And God said, no. You're not passing it on to somebody that you choose or just because it's convenient or just because it works with other people. I'm telling you, this is going to be a miracle and I'm gonna bless you. And then he took him outside and he said, look at all the stars. And he begins to take him through that process of speaking his promise into his life all over again. And then he says, what I need to do is for you to prepare uh, uh, the the the." parts or the process of a covenant with me. And in those days, kind of gross, but it worked. Uh, they would take a, a, a cow or a lamb or whatever, and they would cut it in half and lay the, the pieces side by side. And as the blood would drain out of it, there would be this place of blood. And then the people who were going to enter into covenant together would walk 
take turns walking between those pieces. They would speak words or make vows in the presence of that, basically saying, if we break this covenant, then may we end up like this. That's pretty serious. Okay? But God said to Abram, you prepare it. And he gives him the specific means to do that. And, and so he prepares all of that just as God said. But then he said, and so then he waited. And he waited and he waited. And he says, then about the time when he was waiting, the sun started to go down. And then he got tired of waiting, and so he fell into a deep sleep. And he says, is he still waiting there, asleep, where God has called him to this place of covenant? He's almost missing it, but then a deep and dreadful terror came over him. The presence of the Lord comes into that place, and, and he's, God's kind of has him uh, uh, a little bit comatose, so he doesn't freak out, but he feels it in his spirit. And then God walks between those pieces, and he waits until the sun had completely gone down. Part of that is so that he could really see what God was doing, and a, and a fire pot, or a little clay pot of fire, and a uh, smoking flax or incense, symbols of God's power, God's fire, God's presence passed between those two pieces that Abram prepared and God spoke the vow that he would make covenant with Abraham and bring him in. And look, God didn't just show up and wait on Abraham to get that done and then immediately go right into it. There, there's, there's a place where God has timing. There's a place where God needs to move our hearts to where we can receive. Sometimes in the darkest, at the darkest time, is when we can see the light most clearly. If God would have uh, had a, a flame of fire pass between those pieces at high noon in the desert, it wouldn't have been near as dramatic, near as impressive, and you could have even missed it that bride of sunshine. Are y'all hearing me this morning? And so it's like, why do I have to wait? That's not the question. The question is, will I wait? Because it's not a matter of time. I'm not waiting on time. I'm waiting on God. I'm here to serve him. I'm focused on him. And if God speaks a word to me, then only God can fulfill that word. If there's things that I need to do to bring my life in line and obedience, God is more than gracious. The scripture says that the word of God is useful, not only for teaching and training, but also for correcting, for rebuking, for training us in righteousness. That God can speak a word to get us back on track. God can put us on the right path. God can say, here's what we need to do. God can speak a word in the future, and as Habakkuk chapter 2 says, that when God speaks a vision or revelation, it awaits an appointed time. And then he says, though the vision tarry, wait for it. Same word. Don't just say, well, okay, great. God spoke something in the future. I got probably three good years to do whatever I want, and then, then I'll step right into that vision. Does that sound foolish to anyone else? Glad, glad to, that you agree with me, because it is. So what do we do in the process while we're waiting? We're actively participating with the hope and expectancy. We're letting that word work in us. We're letting God speak to it, not just add to it, but clarify it in our heart. Lord, I don't understand what this means. But when we establish our heart in gratitude and say, wow. All right, Lord, help me reach that. Help me wait expectantly, hopefully, until we get there. And so we wait patiently in eager expectation. Here's a few scriptures that are put there in your notes. In Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3, David says this, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear toward me. It, it literally means he, he bent over. I'm, I'm listening. He inclined toward me. Look, when God leans in, it's because he's listening. How about you? When you lean into a conversation, 
When you lean in towards somebody else, what does that communicate? I really want to hear your words. I really value what you're going to say. And so here David said, when I waited patiently for the Lord, he inclined his ear to me and heard my cry. Watch this. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit and set my feet on a rock and established my steps. Y'all ever have a day when you just say, man, I'm just in the pits, plural. David was in a pit and it was slick and muddy and miry and it didn't say, I cried out to the Lord, get me out of here. And God said, you need to wait in the pit, dude. And so I said, forget this. I'm not waiting in here. This is muddy and it stinks. And so I started climbing and clawing and scratching. And I mean, I I wore myself out. I'm getting out of this pit in my own strength. Is that what he says? No. I waited patiently for the Lord, not passively. And he heard my cry, Lord, I'm down at the bottom. I don't think I can go any lower. I'm in this pit. And Lord, I don't want it to start raining and this thing fill up. Lord, help me. There's no way out. There's not a ladder. God, I can't even see. Are you up there? God inclined his ear. He leaned over the edge of the pit and he heard David's cry. And God reached down. And he not only lifted him out of the pit, he set his feet on a rock and established his steps. And then here's what David said. Not only did I get out of the pit and I was rescued that day, he said, he established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many will see it and fear and trust in the Lord. Now, what would have happened? All the people that had gathered around, if David would have just sat in the bottom of the pit and had a pit pit tea party, just threw a fit, cried out, screamed, whatever, cried for help, just for whoever. He wasn't talking to whoever. He was waiting on the Lord. Father, get me out of the darkness in my own heart. Father, get me out of this place that I've fallen into or, or that I stepped into or I slipped into. Regardless of what it is, his focus and his heart were on the Lord. God help me. And he's waiting on God. In the bottom of a pit, and and I'm sure he's looking around going, all right, if there's something I need to be doing, God drop a ladder, help me to dig, I'll climb, I'll do whatever. But Lord, I'm waiting on you. I'm not waiting for an answer. I'm not even really waiting for rescue. And if God wants to come down in the pit with you, that's... That's plenty of help right there. If God wants to take you out of the pit and put you on the rock where he is, that's even better. But he didn't just put him on the rock. He wiped the mud off his feet. He established my steps. And then he put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in God. Listen, when God inclined his ear to David's request, it wasn't just about David's issues. It was because he wanted to use David in an incredible way so that many would see what God was doing in his life. Look, you are the same. That God has a purpose and a plan for you, and it may seem like you're in the bottom of a pit right now. That you've been dumped, you might feel like Joseph's brothers shoved you in the pit and you've been sold into slavery. Look, man, I'm not for sale. You can cry out, you can do whatever, people can betray you, but if you ask God to meet you in the bottom of that pit, God can take you from the pit to the prison to the penthouse. Come on, somebody. That God can use your life in ways, but it's what we do in those moments. It's not just waiting on God in the sense of passively pouting or or feeling like God's abandoned you or rejected you. It's making that declaration in the midst of those moments, I will wait on the Lord. Not just wait on some help, because how many of you know the help that Joseph found when he was in the pit uh, wasn't the help he wanted. That, that was the slave buyers coming through, and his brothers, you know, had a little auction and, and then shipped him off to Egypt. 
Well, God has a plan no matter where we end up. And if we wait on God, he will not only set our feet on a rock, he'll establish our steps. Somebody say amen. Psalm 130 verses five and six, David again says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, do I hope. In other words, David is activating his hope. He's initiating that hope into positive action while he's waiting, but he's focused on how he's waiting and where he's drawing his strength from. And then he says, I wait in hope more than the watchman waits for the morning. A watchman waits for the morning for two reasons. Number one, he realizes that it's his responsibility and his duty as he's walking on the wall or wherever his station is. It's kind of like guard duty uh, uh, that, that when the the, the sun comes up, the dynamics change, the lighting changes, the whatever, okay? The, the other side is he realizes when the sun comes up, his shift is done. And if you're the night watchman and the morning comes, you're off duty. And so he's, he's not saying in the sense of anticipating, he's anticipating not only the end of the shift or the responsibility, he's anticipating th- that, that sense of now I don't have to wait anymore. Now I know where I am. Now I know what God's doing. Now I'm in God's timing. And a watchman waits for the morning, but I'm waiting for God. And God will meet me there. His light will rise even in the darkness. Isaiah 25, Isaiah prophesied this. And it shall come to, uh, it shall be said in that day. Notice it's a declaration. It shall be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Isaiah was prophesying to a people who went into bondage for years, sometimes generations. So in the waiting, it's not this passive process, it's realizing what got them into bondage was their hearts turned away from God. But here they're saying, we're actively engaging our hope and expectancy, we're binding our hearts to God or binding our hearts to the thing we're waiting for, the salvation of God. And and it's not praying a prayer to be saved, it's literally God salvaging them, bringing them out of the place of bondage that they were in. And when that works in our lives, we, we see the tangible results of that. And it says, this is the Lord. We have waited for him and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. In other words, it's not going to be these years of, man, God, where were you? And why did we have to go through this? And all of those things. When God does a work in our life and really brings salvation into our hearts and into our lives where we've waited on him, we've actively engaged the hope, the expectancy, the promise that he speaks over our life, then it's it's not a matter of looking back in regret. It's looking forward with rejoicing that we will be glad and rejoice. It's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man is in Christ, he's a whole new creature. All of the old things are passed away. Don't dwell there. Your future isn't in your past. God uses your past as a rehearsal for your future. He'll take you through experiences that seem difficult at the time, but if you'll wait on God, if you'll ask for his perspective, if you'll ask him even to use your mistakes that he will use them as opportunities in the future to help communicate to somebody else the grace and mercy of God. Even though we stumble, God upholds us with his hand. Let me tell you about a God who reached down into a pit and brought me out. I waited on the Lord and he inclined his ear to me. He brought me out. Let me describe the walls of that pit to you. Let me describe my heart when I was down in the bottom of that pit. Let me describe how bad that mud stunk. But we don't get stuck on the pit. We say, but man, once you wash it off, here we go. There's nothing like living water washing over you to, to remove the junk, the condition that you find yourself in when God brings you out of what you got yourself in. That's so good, I want to amen myself. I mean, that's just, thank the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, here's the second thing. Not only do we wait patiently, we wait courageously, standing in faith. We wait courageously. David said, wait on the Lord, 
be of good courage. Why does it take courage to wait on the Lord? Because if you're waiting on a God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think, if you're waiting on God because you have a God-sized problem uh, and, and it's like, God, I don't know how this is gonna work. I don't even know if it can. Because to every prayer, heartfelt prayer and cry to the Lord, there's an element of risk. And risk is that place where you truly step out in faith and say, I don't see it, but I declare it. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the substance, the substructure of things hoped for. The evidence, the tangible expression of things we can't see. Faith is substance and evidence that we can't see and we can't touch. How can it be substance? How can it be evidence if it's not there? And then he goes on, verse two says, by faith we understand that the worlds were formed from what was unseen, so that what we see was made out of what was unseen when God spoke into the darkness and created light. And he goes on to describe it. In other words, God doesn't need anything to make it something. That not only can God make something out of nothing, God can take things that you can't see and use them to create things that become evidence of what you do see and what you walk in. And then other people see, man, I didn't even see that in your life because it wasn't there. I was in the pit, I cried to God. God not only brought me out of the pit, God established my steps. That when we put our hope and expectancy in God and we activate it in our prayer, there's an element of risk. That when we ask God for things that he puts in our spirit that we don't even believe. That's the process of hope coming to where belief comes and not only do we believe it, we, we find evidence in the scriptures that God did it and that God can make a river in the desert and, and God can change the uh, hearts of kings and God can defeat enemies and God can shut the mouths of lions and God can crawl in a fiery furnace and we can just have a barbecue, but we're not the ones being roasted. That, that God can do things that... But if we don't establish ourselves in that and step out and take the risk, far too many people pray safe prayers because your God is too safe. I think part of the word of exhortation that God gave Keith this morning was from that aspect of listen, our God is a consuming fire. And there needs to be this sense of. Not only can God consume my enemies, but there may be things in me that God wants to consume. There's a risk. What if it burns? What if it hurts? What, what if I focus on what I've lost instead of what I get again when the new growth comes? What if I can't see the beauty that's going to come out of the burn place that's just blackened? That's faith. What if I'm standing in a place and, and I really want to see it, I really want to believe God for it? Listen, without that risk of releasing it, speaking it, praying it, sometimes even sharing it with somebody else, it's not about what they believe. It's about what you believe. And as you pray it to God, then there's a moment where you're like, oh man, that really does sound crazy. Then as you wait before the Lord, as you wait before the Lord, that's where the courage is. Not to go back and cancel out your prayers. Not to go back and explain to God, okay, I got an easier way. Okay, we're waiting. That didn't work. So we go to plan C and plan D and whatever. And okay, Lord, uh, instead of a total, a total miracle of a million dollars that I was believing for, if I could get $120 by the end of the week. What did God say? What was the need? Where was the faith? Where's the boldness? Where's the risk? 
Because when we take the risk and wait in hope and expectancy, binding ourselves to the God that we call upon and ask to meet the need, God will come through. God will turn the situations and circumstances where faith comes by hearing his word. And it strengthens our faith. He says, be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart in the waiting. Wait upon him, encourage, he'll strengthen your heart in the waiting. And then he says it again. So I say, therefore, wait on the Lord. Don't wait on a better idea. Don't wait on Ford. Wait on the Lord. Ford has a better idea. Some of you missed that. That's, that's okay. Let me get back to preaching the gospel instead of the commercials. All right? So, so here's the last one. Uh, it, it's not only do we wait in courage, wait patiently, but we wait in his presence. We wait in his presence. Why does that make any difference? Makes a ton of difference. Because that's the place where we receive his power. In 1 Chronicles 17, I put the reference there in your notes. It's too extensive for us to really go through and develop. But as you do that, if you would, just go back and reference. It's just so awesome. But it starts David here who wrote Psalm 27. David who said, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He'll strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord. It's the same David who had a desire. And as he's walking around his palace, he sees this beautiful place that he's living in and he's blessed, he's grateful, he's privileged. His heart is open toward God. And, and so he calls Nathan the prophet and he says to Nathan, I wanna build a house for God. Well, why should I live in a nicer house than God has? I want to build a house for him, and I want it to be a hundred times this nice. And so Nathan, the prophet, says, whatever you have in your heart to do, do it, for God is with you. He encouraged him, go for it. And so David, they're praying about it, and you could just sense the, that dynamic, the, the excitement, the anticipation, the expectancy. But then God speaks to Nathan and says, go with this message, with this word, back to David. And it wasn't a word of rebuke. It was a word to, to get his heart on course. And he says, the word was that uh, God would indeed ha uh, allow a, a house to be built uh, for the honor of his name, but it wouldn't be through David. It would be through one of his descendants and that God would establish his throne and that God would establish his line or lineage forever. And, and that through him, a, a savior would come, all this stuff. And so David di didn't, oh man, I mean, does everyone do something for God? God said no. And, and you know, I went and I asked God and he said no. He didn't say no. He said not you. Now when it really comes to standing in faith, waiting patiently, it's hearing clearly. God didn't tell David no. God said there, there's a way that this has to happen. And that way is that it can't come through a warrior, through hands that have shed blood. It's gotta come through the Prince of Peace. So his son, Solomon, would be the one. And so David turns his heart toward it. But as soon as Nathan came with the word to David, here's David's response. He went in and sat before the Lord. He, he, didn't, he didn't go in to ask God why. He just went in and sat in the presence of the Lord for a season, for a time. And he shares his heart. God, who am I and who are my people that we should be so honored that you would speak to us, that, that you would choose us out of all the people. And his heart is just overflowing with all of these things toward God, his gratitude. And he said, God, who am I, your servant, to be able to receive such honor as to serve a God like you? God had just told him, not only are you gonna be a king, but your kingdom will never end. David didn't understand that, that the Messiah, Jesus, would come through his lineage, but God just declared it to him. 
He didn't see the whole uh, vision, but what he saw was God answering his prayer in an incredible way for generations to come that you and I get to be a part of. You and I today are living the fulfillment of the word that God spoke through Nathan to David's life. And how did, how did David respond? He responded in the presence of the Lord and received God's power. When Jesus was crucified and he rose from the dead, came and met with his disciples and he says, listen, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Later he said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and then you will go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. If we don't take a posture when we're seeking God and when our hearts are crying out to God of coming before him and being in his presence, if we'll really ask him, Lord, teach me what it means to wait on you, not just wait for you. Because if we're waiting for God, we can get impatient. If we're waiting on God, we're actively participating in that process. L let me illustrate it this morning uh, here quickly for us, and then we'll pray together. Okay, we have a table set here. And uh, uh, as we come, th this is the illustration of waiting on someone instead of waiting for someone. If uh, I worked at a restaurant and I was part of the, the staff or the team that uh, served people, you would come in and say, uh, you would be seated at the table, um, and I wouldn't get nervous uh, standing around waiting for you because I don't necessarily know that you're coming. But if I'm on the wait staff at a restaurant, when you are seated, sometimes a hostess will greet you or whatever, take you to your table and you'll be seated. And then the wait staff, if they're trained and they're very good, if it's a real fancy restaurant, they, you get a towel and everything. And then I come to your table and I say, uh, uh, hello, my name is Mike and I will be waiting on you today or serving you today. And so my focus and my attention becomes you, not me. And, and I don't say, great, about time you guys got here, I've been waiting on you. No, that would be an attitude of waiting for them. Once they're there, now I put my training into effect. By the way, many times I put on this apron, uh, sometimes it could be different uniforms that waiters wear. We are to have, as we wait on God, we're to wear a specific uniform as well. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6. It's called the helmet of salvation. We get to wear hats in God's restaurant. Breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace, peace shield of faith, sword of the spirit, and praying in the spirit on all occasions. And so when we come, let's just say Jesus was the guest of honor. And so now I'm coming in and it totally changes the dynamic of me waiting on him. Okay, to, to one of the definitions of waiting on is to arrange all of these things. Okay, this is the serving picture. We put it over here. And so now I'm attentive. What would you like to drink? What would you like to eat? Let me explain what's on the menu. I'm just waiting on you. I can't go cook it and bring out what they didn't order. So I'm waiting on them. Once they make an expression of that, then the supply is already there. The waiter isn't the cook. In fact, the waiter can really make the cook look good or not and vice versa. And so God is the one who supplies. The wait staff doesn't buy all the utensils, uh, all of the, the plates, the cups, all of the stuff to serve. They, they don't buy all of that. They don't buy the food. They just serve it as they wait on people. Are you getting it? And so in that aspect, he, the waiter has to be actively engaged. He has to anticipate questions that may come. He has to communicate to them. Uh, if they're not sure if they're going to like a certain dish, he either describes it really well or goes to the kitchen and brings a sample that uh, Kim and I ate at a restaurant several years ago, and, and it's, I'm still impressed, that there was a guy who had an apron like this, but it had a pocket on the front, and they served this awesome bread. I like me some bread. 
And, and so they, these little rolls, they were hot and the butter melted on them. And so when you come out, and so they didn't have any plate set and it was just a tablecloth. And as you, they brought each course, they'd bring another plate or whatever you needed. And so this bread was real crunchy on the outside and just soft and hot on the inside. Anybody getting hungry? And, and so I'm eating this bread and all these crumbs are falling on my area in front of me on the table. So here comes this guy. I'm still eating the bread. We hadn't ordered. And he has this little scraper and he scrapes all the, the crumbs off the side of the table and he puts them in this pocket in his apron. And I went, I didn't realize I was that messy, but all righty then. But I was impressed. So I kept eating bread and dropping crumbs. And every time he passed our table, he wouldn't interrupt. He'd just, shh, 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 shh. and I thought, Man, he's going to have a pocket full of crumbs by the end. And so I asked him on the way out, do you empty that pocket? Where, where did those crumbs go? And so he laughed. Oh, yeah, you know. It's just that deal. The, the attentiveness that was there of if you drop a crumb, a crust of bread, I'm here to serve you, and I got it. I'm just waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to drop one. Okay? I, I'm anticipating that when you drink two drinks out of your water glass, I'm going to be right there. Sir, can I fill that water glass for you? Ma'am, can I take fill that water glass for you? That's great. Okay, I'm lighting the candle. I'm making sure you have your silverware. I'm just waiting on you. I didn't produce any of it. I didn't provide any of it. I just serve it. Now, if we'll take an attitude instead of waiting on God, of looking at our watches, looking at our clocks, looking at our needs, and we'll do what Jesus did and pick up a towel. And Jesus said, listen, we've eaten together, but now I need to wait on you. And from here on out, you're going to wait on me. And let me show you what that means. And he got a basin of water, wrapped a towel around his waist, began to wash their feet. And he says, now, don't ever be too good to serve people. The power of waiting on God is that it brings us into a place of honor that David experienced where it goes way beyond him. That it affects generations to come. And David said, God, I'm just your servant. Well, a servant who's waited on God changed the world. That an, the Holy Spirit would come and speak to Mary, but he would reach all the way back to the word that God spoke to David a servant king, a shepherd boy, who God promoted, who simply waited on him, who was overwhelmed at God's goodness, God's grace, God's power. God, who am I and who is this people that we? And when God speaks to him, he just goes in and sets before the Lord, that, that he finds a place in the presence of God. He doesn't do anything. He, he doesn't try to establish a kingdom. He doesn't organize his army. He doesn't count his money. He goes in and sits before God, just in his presence, and he begins to pour out his heart, and God begins to pour in, and David pours out, and God pours in, and he's here saying, Lord, I'm just waiting on you. If my God can supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, the honor and the privilege isn't just receiving those things. The honor and the privilege then becomes being the one who gets to serve him when he comes in the restaurant, when he comes in the room. Does that make sense? That when we gather here, this isn't a restaurant, but Jesus prepared a table for us. And that we can serve around that table. We can wait on God so we can serve one another. We wait on God, so we serve one another. It's the same heart that we wait in hope, wait in expectancy, that, that it's not what we produce, it's what God has already provided. And then God sets before us a banquet of his love and grace and mercy and life and power and provision. And we're the ones privileged to come and wait on him and to say, Lord, what's your desire? What's your appetite? What would you like today? 
How, how do we take what is in your heart and serve people? Where would you like us to go? Father, you wouldn't have it to go order? We're on it. We'll deliver it. Lord, is there somebody who's shut in who can't get here? Can we get it to them? Lord, you want us to have a block party and to just invite everybody to come? Let's do it. See, when our hearts are there and it's not about us, it ceases to be about my need, that I'm waiting patiently on God in faith and strength and I'm waiting courageously, asking God and, and, and just having that place, of taking the step and asking him for nations, asking him to move in our city, asking him to use me in, in whatever way that he's equipped me. And it's the privilege of that interaction and just saying, Lord, what's on your heart? I'm just here to wait on you. And I'm just here to serve those that you equip and empower me to serve. Not only do we wait courageously, but the real privilege is just being in the presence of the Lord. The joy that just comes from being there. Can we pray this morning? Father, I thank you for the words that you speak, the encouragement that you bring. Father, the declarations that we can then make over our own life that bring us to a place of new beginnings. Father, we talked about these seven declarations. I will live life strong. I will love God's house passionately. I will hold my head high. God, my heart will turn to you at all times. I'll live with an overflowing heart. I'll walk a level path. I'll not lose heart. So Lord, when we declare that we will wait upon you, it brings all the other ones into line. It brings us back to the beginning, but it starts at the end. But if I wait on God with hope and expectancy, I won't lose heart. And if I don't lose heart, then I'll walk in a place where I'm steady and strong. God sets my feet on a rock. And if I'm in that place, it's easy to, to have my heart turn to God at all times because I know he's always going to be there. It's easy for my heart to overflow with gratitude and thanksgiving. It's easy to hold my head high because God is doing a great work in my heart and in my life. Or it's easy to love your house passionately because that's the only place I want to dwell. It's easy to live life strong because my strength is in you. Or if it comes back to the place where we just declare... The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an enemy camp against me, an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. I will live life strong. And as I live life strong, I'll love God's house passionately. And as I love God's house passionately, he'll cause me to hold my head high, lift me above my enemies. And as we walk through the steps, it's not just in those sequence. It's finding God in the midst of the process wherever we might be. It works forward. It works backward. It works in me. It works around me. It works for others. So, Father, I pray this morning that as our hearts turn to you, we make a declaration of a new beginning in our lives this morning. I will wait on the Lord. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, there's a area of my life where I, I'm waiting on God, but I haven't waited, haven't understood, haven't actively engaged the hope and expectancy, and so I've struggled. I got discouraged. I wrestled with that place of trust, and it wasn't courageous. It was just much more desperate. But I'm standing this morning, I'm believing God, and I'm making a declaration. I will wait on God the Lord. If that's you this morning all over the building, would you just raise your hand? Maybe you're waiting on a healing, you're waiting on a miracle, you're waiting on God's blessing, you're waiting on the promise to be fulfilled. Listen, not one word of God will fall to the ground without being fulfilled. If God spoke it, God will do it. If we're waiting on God and actively engaged, it brings us into that place where we receive and not just believe. 
Come on, one more time, all over the building. Pastor, I'm believing God. I will wait on the Lord. Hold those hands up, would you? Many of you, awesome. Now just put the other one up with it. Well, just put in a sign, not only of surrender, but in declaration that God, I'm looking to you. I'm reaching to you and I'm receiving from you. Father, in Jesus' name, every person who makes the declaration in their heart this morning, let it be a new beginning. Let it be this day that they receive and responded to the word of the Lord, that they rejoiced in the goodness of God's salvation. Father, that their hope and expectancy wasn't just wishful thinking, it was what triggered a whole new step of faith in their life. Father, we thank you for it, for your faithfulness, for as we wait upon you and believe you, not only will strength rise, but Father, we'll use that strength to serve others as you have called us. We give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Glory to God. Would you stand together with me? I want to pray with you and just have time. Some of you may want to just connect at a time of prayer. And so we want our prayer teams to come down here to the front. We have a few minutes uh, left here today. We just want to pray and have that time of connection and agreement and waiting on the Lord or sealing what God has done here this morning. So if you have a question, if you have a prayer need, we're going to dismiss in a moment. But as we do, we just invite you to come and receive from the Lord all that he has for you. How many were blessed by the word this morning? And may receive it in your heart. Amen. I'm going to wait on the Lord. Glory to God. Father, we just thank you that it's not just the things that we look at on the external that cause us to be blessed or are the sign, the symbol of your blessing. Father, it's truly when our hearts are established in you, when we're in your presence. Your spirit is in us. Or we're standing in a place of courage and not fear. Or we're waiting patiently before the Lord because it's the honor of waiting on you that your blessing comes in our life. So Father, I'd speak your blessing over your people this morning, each and every one of them. Pray that you would bless them with strength, bless them with life, bless them with wisdom and insight. Bless them with the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Lord, I pray that you would bless them with the courage to pray huge prayers and to see God answer in a big way. God, you would enlarge the place of their influence, their significance in their own eyes, as you reveal to them who they really are in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Prayer teams, if you would, come. And uh, let's connect in a time of prayer. If you need to, not, uh, you can be dismissed this morning in the name of the Lord. God bless you. See you Wednesday night, 6.30. Uh, if you can be here with us, we would love to have you. God bless you, everybody.